So for the Northern Ireland section, you have a range of questions and these all test your skills. Um, you should set aside about an hour for this, uh, out of the hour and 45, uh, you should have an hour to, to blaze your way through this. The first question that you're going to get is going to be a source-based question and it's worth two marks. It's asking you to do two things and uh, you're set aside two minutes. So the, the two is very prevalent the whole way through this. So what you have to do here, there's two marks available for it. You have to use the source and your contextual knowledge to explain a question here, okay? So choose the key part of the source that you're gonna need uh, that answers the question, and then use the explanation of that there uh, with your contextual knowledge. You have to do both to be able to make this uh, into full marks, okay? Um, so this one here, you've got a historian, um, and she is going to go through she's actually suggesting here that the political consequences of internment were serious the unionist government could be seen to have acted with with the army against the catholic population at large breaking any remaining goodwill of catholics towards unionism and you have to use that source and your contextual knowledge to give one effect of the british government's decision to bring in internment so we're going to look at one part of the source that we can use and then we're going to explain it okay so in this case one effect of internment would have been, and I'm using the source, you can see this, I've used the quotation marks as well, it's really important you do that. The political consequences. The source shows that the use of the army against the Catholic population broke any goodwill of Catholics towards Unionists. So I'm really using the source quite well there. Then you have to back that up with your own knowledge. So I know that Catholics were deeply angry at internment uh, because it was targeted uh, at Catholics with no loyalists interned. Right, so you're backing it up, it shows it's very one-sided um, and it seems to be the army has been used against them. And that is your two marks in the bag. The next type of question is question two. And again, it's source-based um, and it should be answered in about five minutes. There's four marks available for this, a two and a two. And what you have to do here is read the question very carefully, uh, annotate if you can, uh, draw uh, even like underline where you can. Uh, so choose a key part of the source that answers that question and then really explain the context by using your own knowledge to explain. You have to do both again to uh, be able to get the marks for this. Okay, so this one here, it's Terence O'Neill writing his autobiography and he suggests, as the party would never stand for change, I was really reduced to trying to improve relations between North and South and of the North itself between the two sections of the community. In this respect, I can truthfully say that I succeeded. During the period from 1965 to 68, the Catholic community came to realize that I was interested in their welfare, while the South began to take an interest in the North. So you have to give two reasons here from that source that explain why Terence O'Neill believed he had succeeded in Northern Ireland in his time of office. Uh, and again, you have to use both to be able to do this. You can see here, what I did here is then, I've taken part of the source and then explained So it says there, the source suggests that O'Neill believed he had begun to, and you can see from the top line, to improve relations between North and South. Well, how can I show that? Well, I, I know this here, okay? From my knowledge, I know that O'Neill met with the Irish Taoiseach, Sean Lamas, in 1965, the first meeting between leaders of North and South in 40 years. So what else does it say that we can actually use? Well, if you look on, it actually suggests that he is looking to improve relations between the two sections of the community in Northern Ireland. So from my knowledge, I know that O'Neill visited Catholic schools and hospitals like the Mater. He also promised them funding which improved goodwill in Northern Ireland. So have I used the source? Yes, I've used it twice. And have I used contextual knowledge? Yes, I've used it twice and I've actually got uh, the full marks for that. So the next question is the usefulness question. It's the five marks, and we're gonna use Caro to be able to answer this. If we use Caro well, a content, author, date, and omission, a bit of own knowledge in there as well too, you cannot go wrong, okay? Uh, so we've got this question here, it's a source, it's from a speech by the Reverend Ian Paisley, leader of the DUP, at his annual conference in 1994, and it says, if carried out, the policies indicated in this declaration will materially weaken the Union and encourage nationalists to believe that their goal of United Ireland is within easy reach. The Irish Republic, in effect, achieves an equal say in the governance of Northern Ireland or governance of the United Kingdom. 
since the parts thereof are indivisible under the sovereignty of Her Majesty the Queen until the Union is dissolved by the United Kingdom Parliament. So quite a long, lengthy, legalistic um, quote and source. But if you look into it, it's quite simple what it's actually suggesting. So this here question is, how useful is that source uh, for an historian studying the reactions of the Downing Street to the Downing Street Declaration in 1993? So, the content here is really useful first, okay? So, first of all, I tie it up to the actual um, subject, okay? So it's useful uh, for an historian studying reactions to the Downing Street Declaration. The content shows the DUP felt that the Declaration, I'm using the source, materially weakened the Union. I'm going to try to use a couple of source, sources, um, or source quotes in this, makes it a, a lot better answer. Then I go on to say what that means. It believed that it weakened Northern Ireland's place in the United Kingdom due to the government declaring it had no selfish interest in Northern Ireland. So I've used the source, I've used my knowledge. It also believed that it put the goal of United Ireland within easy reach. Okay, I've used the source again. This was due to the involvement of the Dublin government in the declaration. So I've got two uses of source and knowledge. And going on to the author now. The author is useful as it is Ian Paisley. Well, why is that useful? He is the DUP leader and it shows why they are opposed to the declaration. So there's my use of author, said who it is and why it's useful. The date is useful as it's 1994. I have to say exactly why that's useful. So the declaration was signed in December 1993. So this would be contemporary source only a few months after making it useful. So it shows the DUP's reaction a couple of months after the agreement was signed. And lastly, I have to include an omission, something that's not there. However, there are omissions. There are no nationalist views which reduces the usefulness of this source. Okay, So that's a, an important uh, element that's left out. So it's only showing one angle uh, of the reactions to the, uh, to the uh, declaration. Question four is one that a lot of people struggle on. You did your usefulness question, and what you're doing in question four is you're uh, doing a reliability question, okay? So it'll be one on the same source you did for usefulness, but you're using a, a variety of different um, elements to actually be able to see how reliable would this be. So what you use for this one is DAMAT. So DAMAT is date, author, mode, motive, audience, and tone okay so date is the date reliable is it around the time that this event happened is the author reliable are they one-sided are they biased uh, are they objective uh, is the mode what it is is it uh, is that reliable so uh, is it a speech is it a, a newspaper report is it a letter is it a diary entry they all have various aspects that will uh, make it more reliable or less reliable in this case it's a speech uh, motivation, what is motivating them to produce this? What is motivating them to speak, to actually be able to suggest what they're suggesting? Uh, is that make it reliable or, or, or perhaps not so? The audience, who is the audience? That there could actually affect its reliability as well too. It might be an objective audience, it might be a general audience, it may be one that's particularly um, uh, targeted you know, for that event. In this case, it is, um, it's the audience to, in the DP, DUP's annual conference. And then finally, the tone. So what sort of words, what sort of phrases, what even sort of punctuation sometimes is being used? What's, what, what type of um, tone is being suggested uh, during this? Okay, so, so what we're looking to do is actually work our way through and try to figure out uh, how reliable this uh, source might be. So if we look at our answer here then, we have uh, various aspects to this. So, uh, this source is reliable for an historian studying reactions to the Downing Street Declaration. And if you look at our date first, the date is reliable because it is 1994. And we have to use our contextual knowledge for this. So uh, you know that the Downing Street Declaration was signed in uh, December 1993. So it's only, uh, it's not very far um, from the actual signing of the Declaration. Okay, so the Declaration was in December 1994, making it a few months earlier and showing a contemporary set of reactions to the Declaration. The author, is the author reliable? Well, it's Ian Paisley, okay? So it shows definitely the, the views of the DUP who oppose the Declaration. That shows your knowledge that they oppose the Declaration. It does not, however, have any other view which harms or reduces its reliability. Okay, so it's only one side of the argument. So that harms its reliability. The mode, well, it's a speech. Is the speech, is that reliable? The mode is a speech. It's a set piece, important speech, 
and would therefore be reliable at providing the opinion of the party at this time. Okay. The motivation behind it then is to explain to the party and the wider world why the DUP opposes the declaration, showing that it believes it will lead to United Ireland. Um, the audience the audience is perhaps less reliable as it is the DUP conference and therefore would contain only supporters who would follow the party policies. So that makes it less reliable as a source. And then finally the tone. The tone is determined and it's designed to instill fear. It suggests that the uh, feared goal of United Ireland is within easy reach, aiming to gain unit supporters with such a claim. Okay, so again, you've got everything covered there. Damat, so date, author, mode, motive, uh, audience, and tone. And you should have you in your six marks in the bag. Right. Then it takes um, a slight turn. Okay, so question five, you're actually, it's four part facts for this. Okay, so it's just various facts that you'll be expected to know. Um, and there's simple one mark facts apart from the last one there. So uh, all you're doing is getting your right answers for that. The last one in particular, though, is one you have to watch out for. It's asking you to explain. So for that one there, just make sure you do explain fully for the two marks. Okay, so in this case, explain one term of the Downing State Declaration. Again, our full stops, important here. The Republic of Ireland agreed to consent. That's um, your first point. This meant, so I'm explaining that, this meant that Northern Ireland would remain in the United Kingdom unless its citizens voted otherwise. This was to appease Unionists. And I know I've got my full marks there for that section. Again, three minutes. You're trying to zip through that. It's just about facts. And finally, we have our essays. Now, you have a choice of three essays, and you have to do two of them, okay? You have to set aside 20 minutes. Be careful to set aside those 20 minutes because this is 18 marks. Um, so 18 marks is a fairly substantial part of your overall unit one um, exam, okay? So it's important to get these right. These right. So look through the three different types of questions and try to actually figure out which one you would be best at answering. Uh, and then go for it. Uh, it's all about your explanation, about your level of knowledge around this, uh, but certainly um, you should be expected to answer the question asked. Okay, and I do emphasize that. Make sure you answer the question asked. Don't just read two or three words and ask what you wanted to ask, or answer what you wanted to ask. Uh, this has to be followed to the rules. Okay, so this first one here reasons for the resignation of Prime Minister Tennant O'Neill, April 1969. Well, I've given a number of reasons here, okay, so Terence O'Neill resigned for a number of reasons. Can you see how I'm linking that to the question? That's the perfect way to do it. It shows you're answering the question straight off. Firstly, he faced internal challenges from his own party, who had not liked him from the start. He was regarded as aloof from an English background. He was also a liberal unionist. Other more popular candidates like Brian Faulkner were considered as future leaders. The party was also worried about his policies. He had met Sean Lamas and kept the meeting secret from his own party. Craig and Faulkner lacked trust in O'Neill. He would also push through policies which angered unionists and led to community tensions. Many unionists blamed him for him encouraging uh, NICRA and for pushing through the five-point programme. Nationalists were angry that he had not fully delivered reforms. Incidents like Burntola Bridge in January 1969 weakened his support. He called for an election which proved that his popularity had fallen with a 10% drop in the vote. He also nearly lost his own seat to Ian Paisley. The event, however, which led to his downfall was the bombing of water installations. This was blamed on the IRA, but was in fact loyalist bombs intended to put O'Neill under pressure to resign, which he did. Okay, so again, I've answered that fully. You've got full range of um, knowledge, full range of historical words in there, uh, and clearly I've answered the, the question from the start. Okay, if it was... Um, the reactions of nationalists and unionists to the Anglo Irish Agreement. Well, I need to make sure I cover that well. So, nationalists were in favour of the Anglo Irish Agreement of 1985. This was due to the fact that John Hume, the leader of the SDLP, had been helping prepare the groundwork. They were happy with the Irish government had at last a say in Northern Ireland's affairs. Sinn Féin and the IRA, in contrast, were against the agreement. They saw it as the Republic of Ireland agreeing to comp or recognise the state of Northern Ireland. Um, Provisional IRA believed it should continue with its violent campaign to achieve United Ireland. So we've got one half did, done there, completed. Uh, next is Unionists. Unionists were happy, deep, or sorry, Unionists were deeply angry. They saw the agreement as a betrayal of Margaret Thatcher, a, a politician, a betrayal by Margaret Thatcher, a politician they believed they could trust. They hated the idea that Ireland had 
a say in Northern Ireland's affairs. They began a long campaign to try and bring down the agreement. This included the Loyalist Day of Action, a rally in Belfast of 100,000 Unionists, and an Ulster Says No campaign, and a rent and rate strikes. All their MPs also resigned in protest. Okay, or if you wanted to do the Good Friday Agreement one, well, there were a number of responses to the Good Friday Agreement. Nationalists were very happy with the agreement. John Hume had helped prepare the groundwork for it through his Hume Adams talks. He was happy to see uh, PowerShine set up and North South institutions. Sinn Fein were also encouraged by the agreement. They had won concessions on policing and had prisoners freed, uh, released as part of the process. The, the provisional IRA supported the agreement but said it had not went far enough for them to decommission, something which would undermine the agreement. Unionists, in contrast, were split. The DUP deeply opposed the agreement, believing it would lead to United Ireland. They campaigned against it at the referendum. The UUP supported the agreement. However, its leader, David Trimble, faced challenges from his MPs, six of whom opposed the agreement. Arlene Foster and Geoffrey Donaldson left the party for the DUP. The public in Northern Ireland supported the agreement with 7% in favour. Uh, with seven, sorry, that should be 71% in favour. So 71% that should be. However, 54% of unionists agreed and 97% of nationalists. Okay, so that should be the full amount of responses for the, um, the Good Friday Agreement. You can put about 94% of people in the Republic of Ireland support it as well too. Uh, but certainly that covers that question as well too. So hopefully this has been uh, useful. Thanks for a lot for listening.